India is a land of pilgrimage to sacred sites. Pilgrims visit these sites to experience darshan, seeing and being seen by divinity. They report that these darshans are accompanied by feelings of solidarity with other worshipers and a transmission of spiritual blessing. The darshans also reaffirm traditional beliefs and practices, some of which go back thousands of years. Pilgrimage to a temple is a journey of transformation that is believed to harmonize the individual with divine reality, so that earthly life comes to reflect the perfection of the cosmic pattern. Temples are laid out according to strict codes of construction, including units of measurement, the siting of water tanks, streets, walls, and worship areas. Strict guidelines also govern the materials used to create the temple murtis, or images of divine beings. Only specialists knowledgeable in the Shilpa Shastras, the scriptures governing temple construction, are allowed to oversee and participate in temple construction. Many of India's great temples are located in city centers, showcasing a belief that the divine reality is at the center of all aspects of human life. Temple complexes are often understood to be microcosms of the cosmic human, images of the divine macrocosm. This film focuses on one of the most significant temples in South India, the Anamalaya Temple of Tiruvannamalai in Tamil Nadu state. It is one of five Shiva temples collectively called Panchabhuta, each dedicated to one of the five elements of Hindu cosmology. The temple at Tiruvannamalai represents the element fire and is dedicated to Shiva, the supreme reality for many Hindus, and to his consort Parvati. In the fire temple, these deities are known by their local names, Anamalayar and Unanamalai Ambal. Subsequent documentaries in this series will focus on the earth temple in Kanchipuram, the water temple in Taruchi, the air temple in Sri Kalahasti, and the Akasha or space temple at Chidambaram. Pilgrims visit these temples in a circuit, with each temple lying about 120 kilometers from the next temple in the circuit. For Hindus, the five elements are the basic building blocks of creation that in varying combinations form the subtle and gross bodies of human beings. By visiting these temples, many pilgrims believe they are purifying the five elements within them and opening themselves to divine blessings. Like we are built out of these five elements, so for me that is a that is a way to relate or to how to say more to to relate to the transformation in the body. You know, these elements are there, and they have to be they have to be brought to life. For me, for example, the fire lingam here in Tirunamla is extremely strong, extremely intense, and purifying. I mean, at each time I go in the inner sanctum sanctorum, and I'm going a lot because we have lots of people taking there. It feels like something is burning me up there in a really strong way. And the same way, the same expression, uh, impression I have uh, when I go to the Nataraja temple, for example, you know, in, in Chidambaram or the, the Water Lingam near Twitchy. That, that is the three ones that I have seen most. The other one, the other two, I've only seen once. But that, these places are, I mean, for me, the Water Lingam, I'm sitting there and I'm feeling like washed, I'm feeling like washed over. It's, it's a completely different energy than the Jyotilingam here, the Fyalingam. It's so different. And still, it's, it's, it all has, for me, it all has to do with purifying. And, uh, you know, like, in a, in a certain way, these, these elements are alive in our body. And they have, an influ they have an influence, they have a strong purificative influence if we are just exposed ourselves to it. Temples in India are always connected to mythological stories that explain why a particular place was chosen for a sacred enclosure. The fire temple is located at the base of a red granite mountain called Arnachala, which means crimson mountain. Pilgrims believe it represents the fire of wisdom that burns away ignorance and brings final liberation by awakening awareness of one's true nature. The Puranas, stories of the gods of India, describe the origin of the mountain. In the distant past, Brahma, the creator god, and Vishnu, the preserver god, argued as to who was greater. This controversy threatened cosmic order. Out of compassion for all living beings, Shiva, the god of regeneration, 
appeared as a pillar of fire before the two contending gods. Out of the blazing light, Shiva's voice challenged Brahma and Vishnu to find the pillar's upper and lower limits. Whoever did so would be acknowledged as the supreme god. Vishnu took the form of a boar and began tunneling into the ground to find the pillar's lower limit. Brahma shapeshifted into a swan and soared high into the heavens looking for the pillar's upper limit. After a thousand years, neither could find the limits. Humbled by his failure, Vishnu acknowledged Shiva as the supreme god. Brahma lied and claimed he had seen the summit of the pillar. His lie was exposed and he stood humbled before Shiva. He too acknowledged that Shiva was the supreme god of all. Vishnu and Brahma then asked Shiva to remain visible as a tejo or fire lingam in the place where he had appeared as the pillar of light. With this tangible sign, they and other devotees could worship him, overcome their negative tendencies, and attain final liberation from the cycle of rebirth. Shiva agreed to this request and manifested as a pillar of fire at the place of his manifestation, Tiruanamalai. Over subsequent eras, humanity lost the capacity to see with spiritual eyes, and out of compassion, Shiva manifested his fire lingam as the present-day Red Mountain, Arnachala. For followers of Shiva, this story has a deeper meaning. Brahma represents the intellect, Vishnu the ego function, and Shiva the Atman, the divine self within each human. When the intellect and ego recognize that Atman transcends these faculties, that human conceptions cannot grasp or control the divine reality, surrender and self-realization can occur. Pilgrims believe that seeing and walking around the base of Arnachala destroys the hold of the ego and leads to moksha, final liberation. There is something about this place that has attracted very advanced devotees spontaneously over the last 1500 years at least. That there's, a, there's a power in this place that saints have recognized. They come here, they see it, they feel it. Uh, Jnana Sambandha wrote that it was uh, a distillation or condensation of Jnana. And Bhagavan said that was his all-time favorite description of Aranachala. So when, when these saints come, that they recognize something in this place that is has a physical form, but is also radiating the power of reality in such a way that those who are sufficiently mature, sufficiently advanced, can tune into that and attain liberation. You probably know the famous line that those, those who think of our natural get liberation. Bhagavan accepted this, he repeated this particular maxim, and he also wrote in some of his verses that it was the thought of Aranachala that had brought about his liberation. Another Purna story tells how Parvati, Shiva's consort, playfully put her hands over Shiva's eyes one day. Deprived of sunlight and moonlight, the physical universe dissolved. Great sages and divine beings implored Shiva to rectify this situation, and Shiva, moved by their pleas, reanimated the cosmos and restored all life. Parvati was mortified by her careless error and went to Tamil Nadu to perform penance. She found her way to Arnachala, where she began walking around the sacred mountain as a spiritual practice. Parvati also assumed the form of the goddess Durga and slew a great demon, Mahasura. When Shiva saw her sincere penance, he appeared and absorbed her into his body, creating the form of Shiva called Ardhana Rishvara. Parvati asked that all who made the pilgrimage to Arnachala be forgiven of their sins. This mercy was granted and is celebrated each year during the Deepam festival in late fall, when a huge flame is kindled at the top of the mountain. The fire temple in Tiruanamalai is a popular destination for pilgrims and is considered an Athrastalam, a Shiva temple representing a chakra in the human subtle body. The temple contains an ancient Svayambhu or self-born lingam similar to this one. Tradition states that the lingam appeared in response to the prayers of Brahma and Vishnu after their acknowledgement of Shiva's supremacy. This lingam is believed to have manifested without human agency. It is permanently rooted in the Holy of Holies of this temple, and unlike the main temple images, is never brought out for processions on feast days. 
Since it is self-born, it does not need to be recharged every ten years with special mantra recitations, as do Shiva Lingams in other temples. This fire lingam and the entire temple embody the Manipura or solar plexus chakra in human spiritual anatomy. It is believed that the lingam's darshan burns away the jealousy, shame, fear, and delusion associated with this chakra when a person is under the sway of spiritual ignorance. Tradition states that the fire temple was built by Lord Vishnu over this lingam with the assistance of the spiritual architect Vishvakarma. Vishnu's role is commemorated by his murti, the flute-playing Vengopala, which is installed just behind the lingam shrine. The temple site and properties remain officially registered in his name to this day. The complex likely dates from the 9th century of the Common Era and grew to its present size over a thousand year period. This city within a city sits on the east side of Arnachala and occupies 10 hectares or 25 acres. The complex rests on a slight west-east slope so that rainwater drains efficiently via canals into two tertums, or temple tanks, located in the fourth and fifth courtyards. In the past, pilgrims took a purification bath in these tanks before entering the inner temple. Today they use two large tanks outside the outer walls of the temple site. The rectangular shape of the temple is oriented 13 degrees north of due east. This means that the rays of the rising sun enter the inner sanctum on both February 16th and October 24th, with one of these two dates probably marking the day the foundation stone was laid. This is not unusual in Shiva temples in Tamil Nadu, although the scriptures mandate an exact east-west axis for stalas of this type. Anamalayar is one of South India's largest temple complexes. The outer layer is surrounded by four massive walls of stone and brick that stand 29 feet high. These walls are each oriented to the four directions. Atop the walls are statues of Nandi the bull, the sacred vehicle of Shiva. Nandi's image symbolizes the unwavering devotion of Shiva's worshippers. Along this outer wall are shops selling souvenirs and offerings for pilgrims. Pilgrims pass through five progressive courtyards or prakarams, symbolizing the five sheaths and senses that constitute a human jiva or person. According to the Shiva Purana, the temple is one of four holy places in India where one can gain final liberation. The great eastern tower, called Raja Gopuram, rises 217 feet and was built in 1516. Its 11 registers are a masterpiece of elegant sculpture rising like a mountain, a place of residence for divine beings like Shiva and Ambal. There are three other large Gopurams, beginning with the Tirumanjana, or South Tower. the Amani Amam, or North Tower, and the Pei, or West Tower. The Pei Goparam is only open once a year during the Deepam Festival. Most historians believe that the West Tower is the oldest of the four Goparams. These sculptures of deities and saints adorn the arched entryway through this gate. Most pilgrims arrive from the east and stand before two open mundapams or halls. During the Deepam festival, this is the main staging area for the temple murtis before their grand processions through the streets. The upper registers of the smaller mundapam feature this image of Shiva and Parvati. Pilgrims prostrate themselves before entering the hall and partake of the arthi or sacred fire that burns continuously during the day. This is a rite of purification and worship that prepares the pilgrim to enter the inner levels of the temple. The central or Alankara Mundapam is a new structure completed in 2002 to replace a smaller hall that was destroyed in a 1996 fire. 
This architectural masterpiece features 44 carved pillars and stands 31 feet high and 22 feet wide. Its upper registers feature gods and goddesses, saints and royal personages. As pilgrims walk through the hallway, they see beautiful ceilings with painted floral designs. Vendors in and around this area sell flowers, incense, jewelry, fruits, sweets, and other devotional offerings to the pilgrims. Large temples like this one provide not only spiritual services, but also economic benefits to the local population. Just to the right of the main entrance is a smaller entrance that in former days was used by royalty, viceroys, and their retinue. The entrance is now used for exit and entrance of temple murtis during major festivals. Some scholars believe that the Raja Goparam represents the Supreme Lord Shiva and that it is not proper for lesser deities to pass through his gateway. The lower outer walls of the Raja Goparam feature these images of Vishnu and other deities. Passing through the main entrance, pilgrims stop to admire stone carvings of dancing figures and deities in the archway's bas-relief columns. The most important sculpture in the archway is that of Viranminda Nayanar, one of the 63 Shaivite saints of Tamil Nadu. The pilgrim now enters the fifth Prakaram, the temple's largest, with its tree-shaded avenues and Shiva Gangam bathing tank. Turning right, one sees a small shrine in the courtyard's northeast corner called Masapirapu Mandapam. The Murti of Lord Chandrasekharar, which is connected to the lunar forces, is carried here on the first day of each Tamil month for washings and worship. The trees in this sector are called dreaming trees. Pilgrims believe that if they fall asleep here and dream, their dreams may come true. When they do, they tie a piece of cloth to the trees in thanksgiving. The interior face of the Raja Goparam looms above the fifth courtyard with its classic sculptures and registers. This image is Bhairavar a guardian deity who protects the temple from evil entities. The Shiva Gangam tank dates to 1516 and has stone steps and open pillared shrines on its four sides. Though in earlier times it was linked to a canal for its water supply, the Tertum is now fed by a spring. Pilgrims are no longer allowed to bathe in the tank but its water continues to be used for ablution rites inside the temple shrines. The Tirtam is also used as part of the Varuna Japam ceremony, during which priests pray for rain during droughts. To the right of the entrance, pilgrims see the famed Thousand Pillared Hall, built in the early 16th century by Krishna Deva Raya. In former days, the hall was sometimes used as a sanctuary for townspeople during periods of warfare or natural calamity. Stored inside the hall are the vehicles used during large festivals to transport the temple's murtis through the city's main streets. The large dancing Shiva murti from the second courtyard is installed here during the Tamil lunar months corresponding to late June and early July and late December and early January. Following pujas and abhishekam, the Lord Nataraja is taken out on processional cars for circuits of the temple's perimeter streets. A beautiful column pattern made from colored rice adorns the broad stairway leading to the hall's interior. Most pilgrims turn left after entering the fifth Prakaram and go directly into the shrine honoring Murugan, a son of Shiva. Murugan is a much beloved figure in Tamil Nadu and his images are found in many temples and shrines. This structure was built by Pradadeva Raya II to honor a vision he had here. 
The Tamil saint Arunagiri had been challenged to a competition by a great scholar who feared that his place of honor with the king would be threatened by the saint. As Arunagiri sang Murugan's praises, a stone pillar split in two and Murugan appeared riding his peacock mount. This figure of Murugan is carved on the shrine's northeast pillar in commemoration of the king's epiphany. Above the entrance is a statue of Murugan with Arunagiri to his left and a female Tamil poet to his right. As a great devotee of Murugan, Arunagiri visited all the gods' shrines during his lifetime, composing a treasured book of devotional poems as he made his pilgrimages. Murugan, also called Subramunya or Karthikeya, is worshipped as a great warrior and patron of Tamil literature, language, and culture. His divine spear and bow rectify human sin and misfortune. His javelin shows his role as protector of Tamil land. His discus symbolizes his knowledge of supreme reality, and his peacock mount his mastery of the ego sense. His six-headed image symbolizes the six spiritual powers awakened through dedicated yogic practice. In this regard, he is called the bestower of cities or spiritual power. Here he is flanked by his two consorts, goddesses Vali and Devasena. Just behind the Murugan temple is the 16-pillar Bangal Mundapam, where women come to pray for the safe birth of their children. Every July, Shiva's consort Ambal is adorned with bangles here during her 10-day Adipuram festival. The glass bangles offered to Ambal are then given to women devotees hoping for protection during their pregnancies. Just west of this Mundapam is a temple dedicated to Ganesha, Shiva's elephant-headed son. The shrine is oriented to the east and sits within a 14-pillared mundapam that is rectangular in shape. The roof is brilliantly colored with a mountain of Shiva-related deities. At the west end of the thousand-pillared mundapam is a small ascending stairway that leads to a hallway of pillars decorated with images of deities. From the hallway, the pilgrim descends into the Patalalingam, an ancient shrine connected to the burial place of a liberated saint. The Tamil sage Ramana Maharshi sat for days here in Atmanisha, or deep abidance in the bliss of universal awareness, after he first came to Tiruannamalai in 1896. Pilgrims receive Vibhuti, a sacred ash that symbolizes Shiva's renunciation of the world. As pilgrims approach the gateway that leads into the fourth prakaram, they may stop to enter two mandapams on their left side that are used for marriage ceremonies at special times of the year. The model for marriage is the divine couple Shiva and Ambal, whose images oversee the marriage rites performed in the hall. Further to the south is a storeroom for the massive chains that are used to haul the great chariots through the streets during Deepam. This precinct also features the sacred Ilupi trees. Ramana Maharshi lived for a time under these trees and near the small Ganesha shrine in the garden. If pilgrims continue to the southwest side of the fifth Prakaram, they find this wall dividing the fourth and fifth courtyards. The reliefs on the stones depict the Pandya dynasty with their fish insignia. Insignias of other dynasties can be found throughout the temple complex showing their hand in the temple's construction. Returning to the main avenue, pilgrims walk past the Rudraksha Mandapam and the first of five Nandi shrines. Rudraksha nut beads adorn the ceiling of this shrine. Shiva devotees wear necklaces of these beads for spiritual protection. This Mandapam is sited along the axial line of the inner shrine where the fire lingam is located. Nandi is a gatekeeper to Shiva shrines, keeping out the impure. His image always faces a temple's inner sanctum. It is customary to seek the blessings of Nandi before proceeding for darshan at the Shiva Lingam. A special Abhishekam, or bathing rite accompanied by Vedic chanting, takes place at this shrine on the 13th day of each lunar month on the Hindu calendar. When this fasting day to honor Shiva happens on a Tuesday, Pilgrims believe they will receive healing from physical ailments. 
Just to the left is the Kalyana Sundar Temple, used for celebrating the fall rice harvest. The festival coincides with the full moon, which is believed to be a time of abundance. During the An Abhishekam, the Shiva Lingam is adorned with rice and flowers, demonstrating the pilgrim's gratitude for the divine gift of fertility. The Mandapam has an inner wall that features these Naga stones. These statues are common in Shiva temples and are related to mythological snake deities that are believed to have powers of fertility and protection from snake bite. This Naga stone is graced by an image of Krishna playing his flute. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that he is Ananta, the cosmic snake upon whose endless coils Vishnu rests in the waters of creation. On the right side of the steps is another Murugan shrine and a Mundapam celebrating the poet Arunagiri. The shrine commemorates the moment when the young Arunagiri, despondent because he had wasted his sister's fortune with the life of dishonor, was about to throw himself off the Valhalla Tower. Just as he jumped, Murugan appeared and caught hold of him, saving his life. With his spear, the god wrote a mantra on Arunagiri's tongue and commanded him to sing songs of devotion the rest of his days. Arunagiri was transformed and became one of the most popular devotional poets in Tamil culture. Upon entering the Mundapam, pilgrims receive a blessing from a Brahmin priest. If pilgrims continue through a small opening in the northern wall, they arrive in a garden that houses this shrine to Vinyagar. Here also is a rare tree, the Vani Maram. The tree is connected to a legend from the ancient Pallava dynasty. During a retreat from the area, Pallava soldiers hid their weapons under the tree. They remained there for centuries, resembling snakes. Nine linga stones and a murti of vinegar stand as a memorial under this tree. The five-storied Valala Gopuram leads to the fourth Prakaram. It was built in three years by King Valalan and opened in 1331. The king's statue is in a niche on the south wall of the tower's archway. Tradition has it that the king became conceited because of his achievement in building the tower. Shiva then devised a stratagem to teach him humility. During the annual Deepam festival, Shiva refused to have his image taken out through this newly constructed gate. For nine days, the palanquin bearing his image exited by an alternative route. Only after the king, in much distress, humbled himself did Shiva relent going out to Valala Gopuram on the 10th day of the festival. The lesson is remembered each year, as Shiva's grand palanquin only goes through this gate on the final day of Deepam. As pilgrims cross through the archway, they stop to buy souvenir images of Shiva and Ambal. They can also admire these floral mandalas along the ceiling. As they emerge from the Gopuram gateway, Pilgrims can turn around to admire the tower's exquisite sculptures of Shiva and Parvati in their various guises. Here Shiva is pictured as the youthful sage Dakshinamurti, who transmits his teaching of liberation to the four sages in silence. To his right is an image of Shiva appearing as a pillar of fire, the Lingad Bhava. On the south side, pilgrims visit the square-shaped Brahmatertam, which dates to 1230. This tank now has a gate that prevents people from bathing in it, except on New Year's Day. This policy was enforced because many pilgrims washed themselves with soap, and the soap residue eventually damaged the tank's stones and affected its fish population. Today, the Tertam is used for a murti bathing ceremony on the four days of the solar and lunar eclipses. In addition, in July on Adipuram, participants in a firewalking ceremony bathe here before running over coals in the third Prakaram. On the festival of Shivaratri in March, the tank is brightly illuminated by oil lamps along its borders. The first temple on the left is the shrine dedicated to Bhairavar, 
the supreme ruler of time in the Hindu scriptures. He is also the fierce protector of the temple and guardian of the eight cardinal directions. In most Shiva temples, the keys are placed before this shrine's murti when the temple is closed for the night. The god stands with weapons in his multiple hands. They are Shiva's drum, a skull, a knife, a shield, a parrot, a bell, and a trident. His head is surrounded by a halo of fire, and his visible canine teeth display his fierceness in protecting Shiva's temple. The Bhairavar shrine is very popular with pilgrims, who ring this bell and ask for forgiveness for their errors. A small distance to the west is the Mani Mandapam, built in 1572. Its pillars feature these exquisite stone carvings. It stands adjacent to the hundred-pillared horse mandapam, where horses were stabled in a past era. The hall is the day shelter for Ruku, the temple elephant, who blesses pilgrims as they move into the third prakaram. There is growing protest in India at the treatment of temple elephants, who must stand long hours in small spaces during the day. Also in this hall, pilgrims can view a miniature model of the entire temple complex. From this perspective, the Anamalaya temple resembles a traditional city with walls, shrines, marriage halls, stores, animals, and an inner sanctum that symbolizes the divine presence protecting the residents. The fourth prakaram is also where pilgrims can enter the temple complex through the south and north goparams. The south goparam, called Tiru Manjana, is nine stories high and has a height of 157 feet. It opens into this smaller Katai tower entrance to the fourth courtyard. This smaller goparam has beautiful carvings of temple guardians and deities in its three stories. Every morning an elephant brings water from a tirtam in the town's south district through these towers. This Ganga water is poured on the ground near the entrance to the second prakaram as a purification rite. At the north goparam, called Amani Amam, devotees of Ambal can enter the gateway closest to her special temple in the third prakaram. This nine-storied tower was built by the 19th century yogini Amani Amalant and stands 171 feet high. Pilgrims dressed in red signal their special devotion to the various manifestations of Shakti, Shiva's female power of creation. Statues of Ganesha and Muragan flank the entryway to the Katai Goparam here. From this perspective, the two towers appear to merge into each other. Arnachala looms in silent majesty behind the two Goparams. As pilgrims enter the fourth courtyard through the south Goparam, they can look to their left to see the temple Gashala. This is the home of the temple cows, whose milk is used in various pujas. At the southwest corner of the fourth courtyard, is the Amavasi Mandapam, where Chandra Shekhar is brought on the day of the new moon. Next to this Mandapam is a small Ganesha shrine where pilgrims can worship the guardian of the threshold in a peaceful grove removed from the bustle of the main shrines. Just adjacent is the Adi Muni Kana shrine. The image on the front of the shrine depicts Shiva and Parvati standing before Arnachala with Nandi, a swan, and a boar. The tableau represents the story of Shiva's appearance as a pillar of fire and Brahma's and Vishnu's attempts to find its height and depth. The rare stele in the inner shrine has two faces. Its front side depicts the divine couple seated on Nandi with a swan and boar carved above and below Shiva. The semicircular incisions represent the mountain. The rear side of the stele is a lingam that is visible at the back of the shrine. The final building in this precinct is the recently built Padam Shrine, where the main focus is this footprint mounted on a platform. The shrine celebrates the spiritual blessing showered upon pilgrims as they walk around the holy mountain, especially during the full moon. 
we now return to the five shrines that sit directly opposite the Brahmatirtam tank. The first of these is the Brahmalingam, which features a square cell set within an open hall that is supported by 12 carved columns. The lingam in the interior has four faces, representing the elements of fire, water, air, and earth. The akasha, or space element, appears as the vimana, or dome, above the inner sanctum. Sculptures of Shiva, Parvati, and Nandi stand guard along the roof line. During the bathing of Murtis in the Brahma tank, the images are first brought here for darshan at the lingam. Moving north, the next pilgrimage stop is the Vidya Dharveshwar Shrine. Vidya Dharas are benevolent spirits of the air, demigods who attend Shiva. They are believed to possess great magical powers and are prayed to for assistance by pilgrims. Next to this temple is a small Ganesha shrine. The Vimana of this shrine has the convex verticality that is characteristic of the Nagara style in Hindu architecture. Moving closer to the Parrot Tower, the pilgrim stops at the Naleshwara shrine, named after King Nala. Tradition has it that the king worships Saturn to be freed from the Lord of Karma's inauspicious influences in his life. Shiva then released the king from all of Saturn's negative effects. The next shrine, located just next to the steps leading to the Parrot Tower, is the popular Elephant Shrine, dedicated to Vinyagar. Tradition has it that a king from Andhra Pradesh allowed his victorious troops to occupy this area. In the night, he dreamt that a massive elephant charged his troops and scattered them. In the morning, he asked his advisors what the meaning of the dream was. They told him that the site he occupied was holy ground, protected by Vinyagar. Upon hearing this interpretation, the king gifted his elephants to the temple and asked for forgiveness. Pilgrims now come to the second Nandi shrine, built by the Hosala king Valala. This shrine stands before the steps leading into the third Prakaran. Pilgrims pay their respects to Shiva's mount before passing through the parrot tower on their way to the fire lingam. To the right of the parrot tower stairway is the begging mendicant Murugan shrine. The murti above the shrine's entrance shows Murugan with his two consorts, Vali and Devasena. Pilgrims now ascend the steps that lead through the kili or parrot tower into the third Prakaram. Rajendra Chola, called Emperor of the Three Worlds, built the structure in 1053. The parrot tower gets its name from a story related to Arunagiri. After Lord Murugan stepped forth from the pillar in response to the saint's devotion, King Pradadeva was blinded by his vision of the god. Arunagiri's rival, still hoping to restore his former prominence, asked the king to send the saint to a heaven world to bring back a Parijata flower. He claimed that the nectar of this flower could heal the king's blindness. Arunagiri agreed to enter the body of a parrot to accomplish this journey. While he was away, his rival asked the king for permission to cremate the saint's lifeless body according to Shastric practice. When the saint returned with the healing nectar, he was forced to remain in the parrot's body since his own body had been reduced to ash. The king was stricken with sorrow at this turn of affairs, but the saint calmly flew to a perch on the Goparam and continued composing devotional poems. The green-colored parrot can still be seen on the outer tower of the Kili Goparam, a symbol of the saint's continuing presence and blessing. During the annual Deepam festival, the mother goddess is carried through this gate on her procession through the temple. Pilgrims now ascend the steps and move through the archway into the third Prakaram. The inner walls of the archway have sculpted figures of kings and saints, and the ceiling has exquisite decorations like this painted tile work. When they emerge into this courtyard, they find the elegant 16-pillar Kachi Mandapam, built in 1202. The floor of the hall is decorated with colorful column. Each pillar is exquisitely carved with temple deities.
During the Deepam festival in late fall, the five temple murtis and the bi-gendered Shiva image Ardhana Vishwara are brought out to this hall for puja and darshan. Directly west of this mandapam is the Shiva Sanadi temple complex, where the first and second prakarams stand. This is the Holy of Holies, the Garbhagriha. For pilgrims, darshan in the inmost shrine is an experience of communion with the Supreme Reality, represented by the Fire Lingam. During Deepam, long lines form along the pathways leading to the Lingam Shrine. It is considered especially auspicious to receive darshan during this festival. The first structure one notices is the temple flagstaff, which is made from teak and plated with gold and other precious metals. At the beginning of Deepam and other major festivals, an elaborate ceremony takes place during which a white cloth flag is raised on the staff. A golden sacrificial altar and basin also sit before this temple entrance. A portion of cooked rice or bali is offered here during certain festivals. At the climax of Deepam, a fire is lit in the basin while pilgrims chant Anomali Ku Arohara and view the greater fire on the mountaintop. There is also a small Nandi shrine just inside this outer mandapam next to the flagstaff. It is the site of important pujas during major festivals.